good morning Duplin County. Welcome to the Community and Small Biz Update. Uh, coming to you live from uh, Surge Radio 100. And that's WEGG 710 AM and W263BE Rose Hill 100.5 FM. And you can also find us on surgeradio.org if you are so inclined to stream us. Um, the show this week is being sponsored by James Brunt Community College, your bridge to success, as well as the James Brunt Small Business Center, where you will find knowledge, solutions, and results. Um, thank our sponsors for the show. We've got a great show for you this morning. Um, we're going to make Ken be amphibious, as Barney used to say. Yeah, I think he meant ampidextrous, but uh, we have Ken Santarelli on the show today. He is the owner and the program director uh, for Surge Radio, and I titled the show from L.A. to Rose Hill, and that's gotten a few comments coming back. In fact, this morning, I posted on the Facebook that it reminds me of that uh, famous duet by uh, Liza Minnelli and uh, Pavarotti where they sing, you know, if start spreading the news, I'm leaving today. I want to be a part of it. Rose Hill, Rose Hill. Um, if I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. It's up to you. Rose Hill, Rose Hill. Of course, I did post on my Facebook uh, that the actual lyrics might vary. But if you do want to hear them singing that song, you can hop on Facebook and, and hear them. So I'd like to welcome to the show Ken Santarelli uh, from Surge Radio. Ken, how are you doing this morning? Pretty good. How about yourself? I'm doing fantastic. Um, you know, you don't really hear of a lot of people going from L.A., um, or New York for that matter, to uh, Rose Hill. So uh, one of the things that uh, we certainly want to do is uh, understand how you found us. And, you know, we're glad you're here. But, um, but tell us a little bit. Let's start at the beginning. Where were you born? Yeah, and just real quick, I realized that I didn't have my mic on when you uh, asked me. I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> so I'm doing two things this morning. I'm doing uh, running the board, and I'm talking. So if it doesn't sound good, call me and let me know. <laughs> but uh, anyways, uh, I was born in Burbank, California on uh, January 5th, 1990. Excellent. Um, I was telling Ken, Burbank is one of my favorite airports, and that's mostly because LAX is one of my most hated airports. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I have family that lives not too far from Burbank. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, growing up, were you always uh, into radio? Um, it kind of started when I was about eight years old. Um, my babysitter introduced me to a, a radio station. Actually, she introduced it to me many years before that, a radio station in Lancaster, California called Hot 97. And then, sometime later, I got into another radio station called 102.7 KISS FM in L.A. And then, suddenly, j -Corp Communications, the parent company that owned KISS FM, also bought out 97.7 and made it a simulcast of 102.7. So, um, that just kind of sparked my interest in radio, and uh, from there... Uh, the movie Contact, I guess, uh, kind of sparked an interest in uh, ham radio. I never d did get a ham license, but uh, I did get a radio scanner and like to listen to uh, ham operators as well as uh, the police and all sorts of different things on there. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I understand that uh, you went on the air, perhaps maybe not so legally, but you had your own radio station pretty early. Yeah, um, when I was 10 years old, uh, for Christmas, I got an FRS intercom and a simplex repeater controller from Radio Shack. And um, so I started a simplex repeater service, and those are not legal to operate on FRS radios, by the way. Um, and then in the afternoons, I would start playing music. And eventually, by uh, June of 2001, I was uh, playing music full time on there. I understand you had some employees that didn't really get paid, but how did you get your signal all the way out through the neighborhood? Well, I had a few friends. Uh, one of them, uh, his name was Alec, and the other one was uh, Curtis, and I had them put repeaters up at their houses, and uh, I had two at my house. One of them I directed south, and the other I directed east, um, and then I had some uh, old TV antennas that I uh, set up on uh, the roof of the patio in the backyard and uh, Alec repeated my channel 3 signal on channel 10 and Curtis repeated my channel 8 signal on channel 14 and 
So we were covering most of the Antelope Valley on FRS walkie-talkies, and then uh, in 2003 we started streaming online. <laughs> yeah, this is a great story, and, and obviously I've been uh, told a little bit more about it. I, I, I'm guessing your parents thought you were, um, you know, whatever he's in the middle of, it can't be too dangerous, at least there are worse things he could be doing. But tell me a little bit about the visit your father got. Yeah, when I was 13, it was May 7th, 2003, 9.48 p.m. <laughs> I remember it very clearly because it was a not-so-happy experience because <laughs> the radio station was my life, more or less. And uh, then I, you know, then it wasn't there. Um, my dad went out to check the mail because he saw a guy looking kind of suspicious walking up and down the street. And uh, the guy approached him and said, Oh, sir, just so you're not worried, I'm looking for the guy illegally broadcasting on FRS Channel 3. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to pinpoint the general area so that I can report back to the commission, and then whoever is responsible will be receiving a $10,000 fine. So my dad came back in and woke me up and told me I needed to stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there's nothing like the FCC to make a morning not feel too bright. But at least, hey, at least they did uh, are moving towards net neutrality. That does help some of us little players a little bit. But so, you know, you were out of radio um, at age 10. Um, I, I still am just amazed that you were streaming back then. But um, so um, you continued on in radio through high school, right? Yeah. Um, a couple months after that, this happened in May of 2003 then in September of 2003 I started up an internet radio station <clears throat> and uh, did that um, for quite a while uh, I joined up with a, a guy from Ukraine named uh, Igor Veklich and uh, um, we did um, English language programming during the day and Russian language programming at night and um, so that was kind of a cool arrangement, but uh, that didn't last too long, unfortunately. And then, then that's when we uh, started the Surge Radio brand in um, April of 2005. Well, what was what was uh, streaming online like back then? I, I'm still trying to get wrap my head around the Russian lessons at night, but <laughs> <laughs> um, back then it was a lot simpler because if you had an internet connection, you could run an internet radio station. Um, in late 2003, early 2004, thereabout, that's when they uh, started cracking down on uh, illegal music sharing online and um, as well as streaming. So people who were streaming online had to pay royalties, and uh, eventually that's what we did. We got a, a license through an organization called Loud City, which is no longer around, but that was how we paid our royalties. And we, we did that Internet streaming through... Um, until about May of 2007. Was your uh, format top 40 then? Um, or what was your music, I guess? Because I, I am a graduate of the school of Napster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I used Napster quite a bit myself back in those days. Um, we did mostly top 40 at first, and then we kind of gradually switched to an underground format that played a lot of uh, underground metal and electronica. Um and uh, as well as some uh, local punk rock bands that we played on the station. And then we also got into some uh, very, very left-wing talk programming that we put on the station. And that was, that was kind of in a rebellious stage of my life right after uh, <laughs> um, my first radio station got shut down. Uh, but uh, now I've uh, gone back over to the right wing. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's nothing like a business owner to make you view things a bit differently. But uh, for those who don't know, Napster was uh, really uh, phenomenal at its time. It was a method for sharing your computer with someone else's computer. But what it really became was sharing your music with someone else's music. Exactly. And ended up being shut down because royalties, license, and copyrights weren't being done. But I think if you were on the Internet back then and it had any inkling, towards music everyone tried Napster um, in one fashion um, or another um, there were, were some other ones too there was Scour and LimeWire yeah I, I, Napster was the only thing and, and of course then you were still on your phone system and uh, you know the the speeds on the internet were, were extraordinarily slow um, but uh, 
you know, when you moved into back then, were you able to see what kind of demographics you had? Where you did the? I know today when you're streaming, you can actually see who's um, listening and and get an idea of what your audience is like. Did you have any of that kind of information back then? Well, now we're able to uh, see geographically where people are listening from. Uh, we didn't have that cap capability back then. We just were able to see how many people were listening. Um, not so much any demographics about them. Okay. Um, you know, the um, you've always been um, interested in electronics and technology. Um, I'm guessing you're uh, a part nerd, just like I am. I'm, I'm a big believer in nerddom. In fact, in two weeks, we're going to celebrate something that happens once a century, pie and to nine digits, you know. I've been wearing that uh, sweatshirt now for several weeks in consecutive. But, I, you know, I understand you were interested in electronics and technology all along, and I believe your first job was IT, working for a pharmacy? Yeah, for several pharmacies. There was a Valley Pharmacy in Lancaster. That was the first one, as well as a American Post and Parcel. Uh, that was owned by the same family, and then he got me connected with another guy named Mazam. Um, he was from Bangladesh, and he owned Desert Drugs Pharmacy, as well as Medicine Shop Pharmacy in Canyon Country. Um, then he took over Acton Pharmacy, and then I got to build the computer networks in two other of his pharmacies before they opened. That was uh, Crown Valley Pharmacy in Acton and uh, Newhall Pharmacy. So you were essentially setting up their network computer system infrastructure, those types of things. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. All right. Um, well, you know, interestingly, I understand that uh, after you uh, graduated from high school, you went off to college, um, and sort of in that way, you started to part with radio for a while. Yeah, in, in high school, I had, uh, you know, my radio station, Surge Radio, and um, there were some unfortunate events that occurred. Um, me getting wrapped up with uh, a gang, sort of, and uh, uh, from there, that, uh, well, one thing led to another, and I ended up uh, parting with all of my friends pretty much in high school, and uh, when that happened, uh, it was not long after that, we, that I shut down the radio station, it was uh, May 7th of 2007, uh, interestingly enough, it was on the exact same day, four years later, that... Uh, from when my first radio station was shut down, um, but uh, so do we need to be looking in four years out from this radio station for some anniversary <laughs> date, or no? Never mind. <laughs> uh, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> but um, yeah, I started going to um, a church in Lancaster called uh, the Desert Vineyard, and um, that was um, where I really began to uh, get serious about my walk with the Lord. And uh, in that time, um, I graduated high school, and then I went on to Calvary Chapel Bible College in Marietta, California. And uh, I had spent three and a half years working toward my two-year degree there, uh, but I didn't actually end up graduating from there. I uh, transferred to um, Graceland University in Lamoni, Iowa. Went, went there for uh, one semester, uh, contracted stage two mold poisoning, and then I uh, transferred to uh, Faith Bible College in Independence, Missouri, and that's where I got my uh, associate's degree in biblical studies, bachelor's degree in theology, and master divinity degree with an emphasis in systematic theology. Yeah, you heard that right, folks. He's got his master's in theology. Don't all radio operators have their master's <laughs> in theology? Um, I'm sure it comes in handy sometimes. But, um, you know, you, one of the things you mentioned, it took you three years to get your two-year degree or, or that. I was on that same horizontal plan as well when I went off to college. For me, I never met a class I didn't like. I, I would have been a professional student if there had been such a job. Um, but, you know, you know, I think... Um, I think it's interesting you parted with radio, um, but uh, majoring in theology, especially going so far as to get your master's, now you're not just it, having faith and admitting, you're really digging deep inside you know, your faith and, and those around you. So um, what did you like about majoring in theology, and perhaps maybe what didn't you like? Well, uh, I encountered a lot of different uh, uh, theological uh, doctrines that um, I was able to study out and 
figure out, uh, do I believe this or do I not believe this? Um, so that was uh, definitely something that I appreciated a lot. I got to learn about uh, the Calvinism versus Arminianism debate, um, and I've determined that I'm more on the uh, Arminian side. And, uh, and then also something that was a really rewarding process was uh, being able to uh, write my thesis paper for my master's degree. I, I did that on systematic theology. So what I did is I developed uh, my own personal statement of faith that was uh, kind of compiled from a bunch of different sources, and they're all cited in there. Um, then I thoroughly went through and defended it and expanded on all of it in, uh, in 147 pages. Yeah, right. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, I was sort of making fun of it, but one of the things that I have often considered and even talked with Phil Gladden about, who's the minister at the Wallace Presbyterian Church, is I would really like to go to uh, get a degree in theology, um, but I think it's more ego for me. I think I would just enjoy the learning process. It's like I would like to go to law school and study constitutional law, but I don't really want to be a judge. So, uh, But I do find it in incredibly interesting. But anyway, you graduated, um, and now you're in the Midwest. You've left the uh, sunny climate of uh, L.A. You've got your, uh, if I understand, you're in a relationship and, you know, you're where the winters are winter and the <laughs> summers are uh, summers. You graduate and you head back to California, right? Yes. And, um, you know, did you enjoy being out in the Midwest? Oh, yes. In fact, uh, it was a, a very, very sad thing for me to leave the Midwest. I, uh, I, I didn't want to leave Kansas City, but... Uh, Unfortunately, I was in a position where I didn't really have another choice. So, um, yeah, there there was a, a lot of different things there that I enjoyed. I enjoyed uh, going to this place called uh, IHOP, not the pancake place. It's the International oh. House <laughs> of Prayer in Kansas City. It's uh, basically a 24-hour... There's a joke in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> IHOP is a 24-hour worship and prayer service. It's running nonstop. It's always going, so people can come and go as they please. Um and then we also uh, attended New Walnut Park Community of Christ there in uh, Independence, Missouri. That's uh, right on the uh, it's the next city over from Kansas City. And I was hearing some popping noises, so I'm over here looking at my meters. <laughs> well, I'm watching you. I'll jump in if it, you know whenever I need to, since you are uh, operating in a dual role, uh, right brain, left brain. We'll see how well it works today. Um, so you enjoyed being in the Midwest, even when you had winters, much like you had last week. The cold weather did not bother you very much. Well, um, I don't mind cold. I just really don't like snow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I I don't either. Having worked uh, in companies where I was uh, stationed and positioned in Maine and some other places, <laughs> um, I have a, a real appreciation for our climate and weather here. Um, so anyway, you make it back uh, home from college, home being back to California, and um, I understand you were encouraged by your parents to um, uh, move on with your life and your career. Well, uh, sort of. Um, my parents have always been, you know, very supportive and very encouraging in, uh, you know, whatever my pursuits are. Um, so I, I didn't actually finish my master's degree while I was in Kansas City. I uh, uh, got part of the way there. And then um, went back to California and completed it via correspondence. And I had uh, a lot of free time because I didn't have anything else going on. And uh, it, it was I was actually uh, quite uh, depressed a lot of the time for, for leaving Kansas City. And uh, um, during that time, I also served in... Um, uh, the role of a teaching minister at Canoga Park Community of Christ. Uh, it, with most churches, it's... Uh, Usually, the senior pastor is the one giving the sermon every week, but at my church it was a little different in that uh, we had a teaching rotation, and uh, I was giving the sermon once a month there. But, um, you know, I was really depressed because uh, I left Kansas City, I loved it so much there, and so finally I say to my girlfriend, let's go back to Kansas City. And she says, Kansas City? Why do you want to go back there? You know, I hated Kansas City. Why can't we try someplace new, like South Carolina or North Carolina? And uh, so, and, I, and I'm I'm thinking like, what's in North Carolina or South Carolina? Why why would we want to go there? 
Well, I'm starting to see, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel titled Rose Hill as, we, as we're <laughs> moving through this uh, odyssey, if you will. Uh, yeah, parents have a way of kind of pushing you, you know, out there. Um, when you were considering a move to Kansas City or that way out place called North Carolina or South Carolina, were you considering radio back again? Well, um, I was sort of. Uh, I decided to look up on a, a brokerage website. Uh, I think it's called CMS Media Holdings, if I recall correctly, to see if there were any radio stations for sale. Uh, first, I looked in South Carolina because that was the first place that uh, Lena had mentioned. I believe you looked at Charleston, right? Yeah, I looked at Charleston, and uh, all I found was a, a single AM radio station there, and that uh, didn't look too appealing. Then there was uh, Greenville, South Carolina. I found another radio station for sale there. And um, then I started looking in North Carolina, and I found... Uh, a radio station in a town called Rose Hill, mm-hmm. WEGG 710 AM, that also has an FM translator station, 100.5 FM. And uh, so I said, this is this looks uh, kind of like what I wanted to do, because there was a radio station in Florida that I had looked at uh, called uh, Play 93.9, which was an AM station, 1290, repeating on an FM translator, 93.9. So I said, I'd love to be able to do something like that. And I was looking into figuring out a way to do it in my hometown in Lancaster, California, but uh, um, the company that owned the stations I was looking at wasn't really interested in selling at a price that was, uh, you know, one that I could afford. Yeah, my my understanding is you bought one and you're leasing the other. Yeah, here, um, uh, I I own 100.5 FM, the repeater station, and I'm leasing 710 AM. Now, the type of license that uh, 100.5 FM is, it's called a translator. And basically what, what that license is, is that station has a license to repeat another station. It can't originate its own programming except for uh, one minute per hour for um, commercials, if, if they so choose. Um, so then the uh, translator can have one minute of different commercials in the main station. But um, when I um, got a hold of Roger Rafson, he was the media broker, he put me in contact with Dr. Ronald Denfield. He's a guy that owns uh, Connor Media Corporation, the company that's uh, that owns 710 and 100.5. And uh, I, I didn't... I gather he's owned it for some time. Yeah, he uh, purchased it from the original founder, uh, Jeff Barnes Wilson, in uh, 1996 or 1995, uh, shortly before he passed away. Um, the station was built in the, in the 70s, uh, and it had a, a country format and eventually was uh, blending in some uh, southern gospel music and uh, offered farm programming um, as well as uh, J. Vernon McGee's Through the Bible Radio. Um, I was actually talking with Suzanne about that here the other day uh, because I used to listen to J. Vernon McGee um, in my college years. He came on the radio station that I listened to um, every night at 11 o'clock so I would lay in bed and listen to him and then as soon as he got done I would fall asleep. But um, yeah, Dr. Benfield bought it and turned it into a country station and that lasted for less than a year and then it became um, a uh, gospel radio station uh, for most of the time except for six months as a Spanish station and six months as a fundamental Baptist station. Yeah, we're going to come back to uh, the country station because I think, uh, uh, interestingly, that was part of your plan B. You know, we'll come back yeah. to it uh, in a second. But were there any other states that you looked at seriously besides uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida? Um, I looked at Georgia a little bit and uh, Virginia. But uh, the main thing was that my girlfriend wanted to be someplace warm. Some place okay. uh, that wouldn't be cold and we wouldn't have uh, snow like we did in Kansas City. Um, so I wasn't able to purchase the whole radio station right away. Um, so I had uh, talked with uh, Dr. Benfield about an agreement, and he said, well, if you will purchase the 100.5 FM translator, I'll let you do an LMA, or basically a lease agreement, on 710 AM. So my start date was November 1st of 2014. and um, Did you go on the air then? No, not right away. Okay. Um, we continued with the gospel format um, under uh, my lease for uh, the next two weeks. I was bringing in equipment and doing some upgrades because uh, the majority of the equipment in here uh, was really antiquated, and um, some of it was in bad shape. So I brought in um, a new computer 
and uh, in fact two new computers and after we went on the air pardon me um, brought in a new mixing console and some more new equipment and uh, we've gotten it to a point now where it uh, it works pretty good but it, uh, for those who were listening on Monday uh, you would have noticed that we were having some uh, issues with our 100.5 signal cutting in and out um, we had a piece of equipment go bad at the um, at the other tower site over by River Landing in Wallace. Yeah, you know, it. Um, one of the things, and we'll come back to that as well, you, you live in Wilmington, because I've always found Charleston really an amazing place. I do enjoy visiting Charleston. It's full of so much history, going back to the 1500s, in fact, and the food is excellent. And honestly, Wilmington is like a little Charleston, but uh, we, you live in Wilmington, but my understanding is you don't get to spend a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, um, in Charleston, I never actually been to Charleston yet, but um, I live in Wilmington. I live um, right on the north end, and uh, pretty much I'm here every day, seven days a week, in Rose Hill, and I go home to sleep. <laughs> and uh, you know, I thought it would be uh, real cool to live in Wilmington because I've always lived in the city, except for my one semester in Lamoni, Iowa, where um, there was uh, 2,400 people there. 1,000 of which were the university students, and then half of the 1,400 non-university students were Amish. <laughs> but other than that, I've always lived in a city. Uh, so I figured it would be good to um, live in Wilmington, and then I can have that city atmosphere, and then I can come to work here in Rose Hill. But it's uh, ended up being that I don't actually spend any time in Wilmington other than sleeping. Yeah, you know, interestingly, I came from a very rural area of North Carolina, Johnston County, Ken Lake population, maybe... In 1978, was 700 people, um, and I've lived in Wilmington, and everyone always said to me, "Wow, that must be really fun. You live in at the beach, and you must see it." And honestly, I never saw the beach, or never, you know, because <laughs> much like you, I was always gone and uh, somewhere else. But uh, you do spend uh, an incredible amount of time, and and you know that's not uncommon for most small businesses working seven days a week, not really having a personal life, especially as you get things started. Um, so you told us how you found uh, Rose Hill, um, and you told us you finalized it. So you're on the air come somewhere around in November. Um, but let's talk about the format of the radio station a little bit. What is your current format? Well, it um, the format is actually not too definable under the uh, you know the different uh, radio genres that. Uh, um, the titles that are available out there for radio genres. Uh, we call it Adult Top 40, but that's not quite it. But it's it's mostly. Um, some people have suggested that we're a dance station, and we are sometimes, but not, uh, not full-time. Uh, if you listen in the overnight hours, we play a lot of dance and kind of clubby music, but during the day it's uh, kind of toned down more. It's um, more of a regular Top 40 station, but rather than your typical Top 40 station, which is geared toward... Um, age 25 and up, we're kind of geared more toward age 35 and up, except for in the overnight hours. And then that's more uh, 25. Um, then we also um, offer some other programming. Um, on Sundays, we continue to offer uh, gospel music and uh, local ministries. And uh, we have Southern Farm Network now. Uh, again, that, that actually was on the station under uh, Jeff Barnes Wilson's ownership. And that's something that we uh, brought back with this format. And uh, we have uh, a lot of feedback now. We have uh, almost, I think we're almost at uh, 1,400 followers on Facebook. Oh, it's excellent. Excellent. Um, I know, you know, we're part of the the programming on 9 to 10 and, and absolutely am loving this. And it's starting to get a following. I, you know, I wasn't clear or sure uh, whether people would want to listen in, or, or uh, but there seems to be... Um, a following. We don't quite have the number of likes that you have on Facebook, but I'll get there. Um, so, you know, in in that format, one of the things that you were talking about is you've focused on a slightly older group than a, than a top 40, and I understand you don't play the number one song over and over again as mm -hmm. many radio stations might would. So you've got a, I, I don't know if eclectic, but a different mix mm -hmm. in how you play things. Yeah, we, uh, we try to have... Um you know, a pretty good variety. But uh, one thing that we decided when we were putting together this format is that we didn't want to play anything that was slow. We wanted to keep it uh, all upbeat. And uh, people have uh, seemed to really appreciate that. In fact, uh, Suzanne Wilson, who's uh, 
the uh, general manager here. She's worked here since uh, she was 14 years old. The station was built when she was 10, and now she's 52. I hope she doesn't mind me giving out her age on the radio. <laughs> Susanna, You'll find if out if she does. <laughs> Suzanne, if you're listening, please forgive me. Hmm? <laughs> but um, uh, she said that she was absolutely amazed when she saw me bringing in all this new equipment. And uh, then when she tuned in, her comment was that she had never heard the sound quality so clear before. And, you know, I, I don't really know what it was that I did differently other than what you're supposed to be doing with a radio station. Uh, and uh, just uh, been trying real hard to uh, bring things here up to date. You know, our, our phone systems are still uh, very antiquated. Um, but uh, hopefully we'll be uh, relocating out of the trailer here in Rose Hill within a couple of months to uh, a nicer yeah, I was going to get to that. I know you're looking um, at doing that, but, um, you know, it, it's clear a lot of small radio stations, especially uh, similar to, to this one, didn't get a lot of investment over the past few decades because in some ways radio was going down in its popularity. But my understanding is radio is coming back now. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm assuming some of that is, is because of Sirius and, and those kinds, but the radio format seems to be popular now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we um, radio is definitely a uh, a medium that a lot of people are going to use in order to get information out to the community, as well as um, you know for advertising purposes because uh, people do listen in their cars. Um, Eighty percent of people listen to uh, radio in one way or another, whether it's uh, you know in their car, at home, um, through streaming audio online or satellite radio. Uh, Eighty percent of people we've uh, we've seen listen to radio all right and you know i'm gonna come back too because you've got some data about your demographics and you know how many are listening versus what was uh the count if you will when you when you first started but you know as with every other show that we've had it's hard to believe we've already gone through the first half of our show <laughs> so we will open up the phones and certainly i want you to call in because i want to see if ken can do three things at one time you know answer <laughs> the phone run the board and answer the questions um, the call-in number is 910-289-2031. Again, it's 910-289-2031, and you are listening to the Community and Small Biz Update for Duplin County, sponsored by uh, James Brunt Community College, as well as the Small Business Center at James Brunt. Um, and again, 910-289-2031. Don't be bashful. Um, Going back, Ken, um, when you first got here, tell us who you, the best you could tell. Who was your audience and rough percentages of who was listening? Um, originally, uh, we did some demographic research and determined that the previous format was reaching between 6 and 12% of the population here. And uh, that, that's not, uh, not too favorable when you're trying to uh, make money with the radio station because... Uh, before it was a gospel format, and uh, people were calling in after we changed the format, and uh, they the common thing was uh, they were concerned that the elderly wouldn't have anything to listen to, and um, they were upset with me for taking away a, a radio station that was doing the Lord's work, uh, and things like that. But uh, what they didn't understand is that this radio station was not uh, generating sufficient funds um, to uh, be able to pay everyone's salaries and then all of the operating expenses and and all of that um so yeah you did not open this as a 501c3 this no. is not a non-profit organization it's a small business but you're trying to make money and mm -hmm. so your economics are have to be um how you make some of your decisions exactly um we still continue to offer gospel programming on sundays but then um, um even though we do that there was a person who called up and said that we've uh, established a committee to uh, bring gospel music back to the radio station during the week, and we want you to come to uh, to our committee meeting. And I uh, had talked with uh, Dr. Benfield, uh, the owner of the radio station before, um, and he said that they did that to him once before when he changed it to Spanish. And he said that he um, went to the committee meeting at a church, and there were 500 individuals in that church that were really upset with him. And to quote what he said, he said uh, he felt that the atmosphere was as if he had shot the Pope. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I, you know, 
I'm, you know, conscious of, of uh, change. Most people uh, are get uncomfortable with change. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just very human. Um, and but it seems like we got an extra dose when we come to small rural areas. We really are resistant. Uh, to change, so I certainly understand the pushback, people wanting their old format, mm-hmm. um, but I certainly appreciate that you have to make decisions based mm-hmm. on what's economically viable for the station, or you won't stay here. Mm-hmm. Um, so what what about your demographics now, your, your listening chip, how much, uh, what do you think you're reaching now? Well, uh, we built this format um, based on the demographic research that we did, and um, We've determined that this new format would serve between 30 and 40 percent of the population, which is a significant increase. And it's like um, ten times or nine times. Mm-hmm. And that'll uh, definitely look more appealing to potential advertisers. Um, before the radio station generated uh, the majority of its income through um, brokered programming, you know, selling time to local ministries and uh, as well as donations, uh, they had what they called the Gospel Messenger Club, which um, people could uh, pay ten dollars a month. And uh, in exchange for their $10 a month donation, they would get their uh, name mentioned on the radio. So uh, those two means were how the majority of the station's income came. And they had about uh, three other business sponsors. And three business sponsors is uh, very low. Right. And uh, now we have, uh, we have eight, I think. Yeah, that's. Uh, does that include us? You know, <laughs> um, yeah, we are certainly James Brunt and uh, the Small Business Center. James Brunt are sponsoring um, this show. I, you know, uh, again, the uh, call-in number is nine one zero two eight nine two zero three one. That number is nine one zero two eight nine two zero three one. And I do want you to call in because we really do need to videotape Ken doing three things at uh, <laughs> at one time. Um, one of the things that I've been doing for every one of our shows is I've had a joke for us somewhere around the midway point and I got a joke this morning and it's for us nerds a little bit. Um, it, the, the joke is three engineers and three accountants were traveling by train to a conference and um, At the station, the three accountants purchased their tickets, and they watched as the engineers bought only one ticket. Um, How are three people going to travel on one ticket, the accountants asked, and watch, and you'll see, the engineer said. Well, they all boarded the train, and the accountants took their respective seats, but the three engineers all crammed into a restroom and closed the door behind them. Shortly, you know, after the train departed, the conductor came around collecting tickets, and he knocked on the restroom door and said, Ticket, please. And when he did, the door opened just a crack, and a single ticket came out, and he took it and went on. The accountant saw it and agreed it was quite, you know, really a clever trick. So after the conference, they decided to copy the engineers, and they bought just one ticket. But to their surprise, the engineers didn't buy any ticket, and they got on the train and they were really, you know, wondering what was going on. How are you going to ride the train without any ticket? And the engineer said, just wait, you'll see. Um, so anyway, when they boarded, the accountants got in the bathroom just like the uh, engineers had done previously. And then uh, the engineers got in another bathroom that was pretty close by. And then the train departed. And afterwards, one of the engineers left the restroom. And he walked over to the restroom where the accountants were. He knocked on the door and said, ticket, please. <laughs> Think about it for a second. All right, uh, I did hear the phone ring. So, uh, who do we have on the air? Hello, hello. Do we have somebody on the air? Apparently not. Okay. Well, if you were trying to call, call us back. Uh, that number is nine one zero two eight nine two zero three one. I did get to see Ken do three things. Uh, call in again, and uh, we'll try to get you back uh, on the air. Um, you know, we talked about change. We talked about format. You did have a plan B in case this top 40 didn't work. What was your plan B? Well, um, I thought about uh, possibly doing country if this one uh, didn't work. But it uh, two things. One, this one is actually working quite well. And uh, two, there just isn't the demand here for country that I thought there would be. That surprises me, too. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I found out that a lot of people here actually uh, like something called beach music, and I didn't even know what that was when I got here. And uh, Kurt Simpson Simpson actually uh, introduced me to what it was. And um, I hear a lot of people, they they come in here and they talk about how there are so many people that like beach music, yet at the same time, 
every single person who has told me that a lot of people like beach music, none of them them themselves actually like beach music. Well, I actually like beach music, and I do understand a little bit of the genre. It's a spinoff very specific to the South Carolina, North Carolina, East Coast type thing of rhythm and blues. It's a rhythm and blue type uh, format. And, uh, you know, one of the things, just to digress for a second, one of the radio stations that's international for Surge Radio is one in the U.K., so if they are listening, you know, one of the dances that's popular with beach music is called shagging. And, of course, shagging has a different meaning if you're in the U.K., so we won't go there. But, uh, um, yeah, uh, beach music quite popular, especially when I was in high school. We had bands like the Embers, the Chairman of the Board, the Showman, those types of things. Um, and I would listen to a beach music format. Do you have uh, beach music on now? Um, we don't right now, but there was actually... Um a uh, syndicated program that I was uh, looking into picking up possibly for uh, Saturday evenings and um, still considering whether or not uh, whether or not I want to do that but uh, uh, people come look us up on Facebook or at facebook.com slash surge radio NC like North Carolina um, or you can get the link at surge radio.org and come on the Facebook page and let me know what you think about that whether uh, whether you uh, want that on there or not, and that'll probably uh, assist in the decision-making process. Yeah, and you can survey on Facebook as mm-hmm. well. One of the things that I have uh, really promoted or tried to promote in the Small Business Center on our Facebook page is telling us what you need, what you want. I have some flexibility in seminars and workshops that I offer, um, and so one of the things I'm constantly asking is, what do you want? What do you need? You know, How do I better serve uh, the community? And you've got that same... Uh, interest you know you are a small business owner this is a small business uh, radio show so what are some of the things that you like about owning a radio station well um, I definitely enjoy um, you know being my own boss (laughs) that's uh, definitely something I really enjoy Um, I enjoy um, all the wonderful people that I get to work with here Um, and uh, I enjoy just uh, being able to uh, be a part of the community This is a wonderful community out here, and I look forward to moving out here. Then I can uh, get involved even more than I am now. Um, But uh, well, to that point, I mean, one of the things that we certainly we're going to ask you: you do have plans to um, move the studio, if you will, from its present location by the AM Tower to where? uh, Downtown Wallace on Main Street. Um, I'm actually working with uh, Kurt Simpson on uh, um, purchasing a. uh, a little building on Main Street. I'm not going to say where just yet, but uh, oh, we got a call here. Yeah. Hello, you're on the air. Who's this? Hello. And they just hung up. Okay. Well, we keep uh, losing somebody. I apologize for that. Again, the number is nine one zero. Two eight nine two zero three one. Again, that number is nine one zero two eight nine two zero three one. But we won't miss a beat. You're looking at moving. Do you have a uh, timing that you're thinking about uh, making that move? Um, hoping to be able to do that by uh, the summertime. Okay. Uh, been uh, working with uh, BB and T on uh, getting a loan for for that building. And uh, one thing that they told me I needed in order to get that loan was a business plan. Oh, I happen to know where one of those might come from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it's, um, I will share uh, that uh, you've become one of the clients of the Small Business Center. We certainly look forward to, I certainly look forward to working with you, and we will um, work on the business plan. Um, what about some of the things you don't like so much, mundane things of being a small business owner? Um, paperwork. I, I really don't like the paperwork, but that's something that uh, you know you got to do. It's um, it's a part of the business. What's some of the paperwork you have to do for a radio station? Well, the, the one that takes up a lot of time is um, royalty music reporting. Uh, now, Connor Media Corporation actually handles uh, the royalty reporting for um, ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, and then um, Surge Media, which is my company, uh, handles uh, for Sound Exchange. So we we got to fill out several forms and then we have to uh, print out a, um, a a document that contains every single song that we've played how many times we've played it how many people were listening online when we played it and uh, 
I think that's it. I, you know, I, it sounds like a boatload of fun. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But you have to fill it out. I mean, that brings up one of the points. Um, my understanding is your programs are, are really planned out, and your music director isn't just next door. Where is your music director located? Uh, he's in Beaverton, Oregon, near Portland. <laughs> wow. Um, and but but tell a little bit about how um, organized, if you will, your your programming is. Well, um, you know, we have our program schedule that's up on our website, and you can see all the different uh, programs, what comes on at what time. And the music that we play, uh, the whole music format is uh, developed by um, our music director. His name is Michael Oakes. He runs uh, a number of different internet stations, uh, the most popular of which is uh, Energy 98. It's the number one most listened to dance formatted radio station in the world. And he also runs a radio station called uh, The Vibe in Las Vegas. That actually used to be on 94.5 FM, but uh, it transitioned to an internet only format. And where I actually first heard of him was uh, when I was 15 years old. He was the program director of a radio station called Energy 92.7 and 101.1 in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, then I actually got to meet him when he became the program director of The Vibe in Las Vegas. And that actually wasn't on the most friendly of terms at, at first because I was very critical of how he altered the format from what it was before. <laughs> so um, we got to talking, and eventually... Um, I said, hey, I'm going to be in your area uh, tomorrow. I would like to meet up with you for coffee if you're available. And, uh, you know, he was working, but he invited me to come by uh, the uh, studios of KEX in, uh, in Portland, which is a news talk radio station there. So we, we were there for about two hours, and, uh, and I was uh, chatting with him, and we had a very good conversation. And then um, just uh, last year in... in uh, August, when I first found this radio station, I said, uh, you know, how can we go about using the logs from one of your uh, internet stations that you program uh, for a radio station that I'm going to be uh, possibly taking over in uh, North Carolina? And uh, he said, well, we don't have to do it that way. I can actually do a custom one for you. And uh, he asked me what I wanted, and I said, can we do a, a hot adult contemporary music format that kind of leans dance? And um, after discussing more about uh, what tracks to play and, and things like that, he said, um, I would suggest an adult pop format that is dance friendly. So that's what um, we have built here. But uh, like I said, it doesn't really fit into any of the traditional genre categories for radio. So um, to... The long, drawn-out one is uh, it is a rhythmic, hot, adult, contemporary, leaning, adult top 40 format, which is dance-intensive. Okay, everybody, say that three times really fast, <laughs> and you'll understand the format. No, um, I, I get it, and, and I do like the format. Um, one of the things that you mentioned already is the radio station has a Facebook page. Talk a little bit about the importance of social media. I know I find uh, working with small business clients that social media is really important. Yeah, social media is a very vital part of the radio station because that's how we uh, get information out to our listeners. You know, we don't have any um, full-time on-air personalities at the radio station right now. It's mostly computer automated. We do have uh, Robert Osborne who comes on. He's actually um, one of the local chairman of the uh, Duplin County chapter of the NAACP and we ha we'll have him on later today from 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock and then he comes back on Sundays and does um, an all gospel program from 1 to 4 on Sundays as well but other than, um, than him we don't have any live personalities on the radio if you hear anyone talking they're, um, it's a pre-recorded program like uh, Michael Oakes our, our program director, music director rather um, does a new music show every Saturday night at uh, sorry Sunday night at 8 p.m. where he showcases new music and gives people the opportunity to vote. Now, that program that he does is not just on our station; it's also on his internet station, Energy 98, as well as uh, Two Wild 107.5 HD2 in Portland. But as I was saying, with social media, um, that's how we get information out to our listeners. So we encourage anyone who's listening to come follow us on Facebook and. Um, see what we're doing you know anytime we have a technical glitch or anything I'm always on there posting uh, what's going on and what we're doing to resolve it 
Um, anytime we have a program coming on, I do my best to try and promote it beforehand. Um, yeah, I saw you promoted this show last night. Yeah, and, yeah and, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, after six months, you consider me one of your on-air celebrities. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. Um, but, but no, I, you know, talk a little bit about your advertising. I, I, the crux, I'm guessing, of any small business radio station is your advertising. Exactly. There, there's two, um, well, actually, there's three different ways a radio station can generate uh, revenue. That's uh, number one, the most popular is by uh, advertising. Um, getting uh, local businesses to uh, promote themselves on local radio. And if you want to advertise, you can go ahead and call that number. 910-289-2031. <laughs> we can do four things. Yeah, we, you can uh, call any time during the week, and I'm here, and uh, can uh, get your business promoted on the radio. Um, the other uh, One of the other ones is uh, brokered programming. Basically, uh, you purchase time on the radio station to run your own programming. That's what we do on Sundays with... Uh, some of our sermon programs. And that's what we're doing today. Mm -hmm. yeah, ex at, yeah, that's right, it is. Um, we have Bishop Curtis West at, from the Way of Truth Free Gospel Church of Christ in Wallace that um, buys time on Sunday mornings. We have East Point uh, Human Services in Beulahville. They do a program with Darlene Layseth on uh, uh, Sunday mornings. And we also have the Lutheran Hour. And those are, uh, and then as well as this program, Small Business Update, uh, those are four different uh, brokered programs we have on the radio station. Now, the, the third and final way, um, which probably won't happen so much with a commercial radio station like this, is donations. That's um, usually what uh, non commercial radio stations do to generate revenue. Now, non commercial radio stations can actually generate revenue through um, another means known as underwriting announcements. And that's a fancy term for uh, advertising on a non-commercial radio station. There's some restrictions on that in that you can't make any call to action, you can't use uh, qualitative language, and you can't make any mention of price. So you can't say, like, for only $99, or come on down today, or call us now. You have to say our address is, our phone number is, et cetera, right. et cetera. And you can't say, like, the best in town or whatever. So that's an NPR-like mm -hmm. format, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but I mean... Your reach, I think, with ads might surprise people. It's not just Duplin County, is it? Uh, no, our 100.5 signal reaches uh, 70,000 people. Like that doesn't mean there's 70,000 people listening necessarily. But that's coming. It, yeah, it's, <laughs> we'll get there eventually. Um, it serves. Uh, it, it covers 70,000 residents in Duplin and Pender counties, um, as well as a small portion of Sampson County. Now, our 710 signal covers pretty much all of eastern North Carolina. So when we're talking right here, we're being heard in Wilmington, Jacksonville, New Bern, Goldsboro, Kinston, Smithfield, and uh, uh, Fayetteville, and sometimes Raleigh, depending on the weather. Wow, that's a, that's a pretty big reach. Um, and you know, one of the things that uh, I wanted to talk with you about, again, this is still in the planning stages, um, there has been some discussion that your FM signal doesn't actually cover uh, Duplin County as well as you want the northern mm -hmm. portion. So how are you thinking about maybe addressing that? Um, I've been in talks with uh, Dr. Benfield. He actually owns another um, radio station here locally. It's on the same tower as 100.5, but it operates at like 1 20th of the power. Um, it's 92.7 FM, and what we've been uh, talking with him about doing is moving that 92.7 from the tower near River Landing in Wallace uh, to the AM tower here because if anyone comes here and looks at the AM tower you'll see these two little ring things hanging off the left side that's actually an FM antenna that was uh, used once upon a time ago for 95.9 FM um, now our 100.5 signal is 250 watts and uh, it has some deficiencies in uh, places like Warsaw and Kenansville and we're hoping that uh, when we put this 92.7 up here, that that'll help uh, fill in some of those areas where there's some signal deficiencies. And um, you know, I know that there's uh, a lady that works at the BB&T in Rose Hill, and uh, she is uh, asking me uh, half the time when I go there. She asks, like, so what's the status on that 92.7? Oh, okay. Because uh, she said that uh, she can't hear it at her house that well in Kenansville. Okay. Well, that, that's interesting to know. I mean, I know that uh, your top-rated, most entertaining live small business talk show is this one, but uh, 
think it's your only one, but nevertheless, um, you've got some you know pretty broad um, programming that's coming on. Um, share with us why uh, this show isn't aired on the AM channel in the evening. Well, um, now our AM radio station. Whenever you listen to 710 or 100.5, you'll hear the same thing going out on both signals. It's a simulcast. Now, 710 was built in 1971, I believe, is when, when it first went on the air. Um, that's when they were issuing licenses on these uh, AM channels known as Clear Channels. Now, that's not to be confused with the company Clear Channel Communications, but it's a, a Clear Channel station. It's a station that operates at a really high power day and night. And there, on 710, there's a station in uh, New York City called WOR. There's also one in Miami, but that, that one is different in that that has a directional array, and it's shoved more south, whereas the one in New York is kind of uh, non-directional for the most part, I think. So as the sun starts to set each day, um, especially in the outer areas at first, of our coverage area like Wilmington, Jacksonville, New Bern, et cetera, et cetera, you will start to hear some talking in the background. And that'll get louder and louder as the, the evening grows on until eventually we sign off. And then you'll hear WOR in New York City loud and clear here. So in order to prevent interfering with WOR, we have to shut down at night our, um, our AM station. But we're able to continue operating 100.5 24 hours a day because... AM radio stations, you see, if you come by our office in Rose Hill, just north of Rose Hill, you'll see a tall 300-foot uh, red and white tower, but what you also don't see is a radial ground plane that's buried in the ground. It's like iron rods that are uh, going out from the tower in the ground every three degrees. Sort of Stonehenge-like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and with that... AM radio stations have what's called a ground wave propagation where it conducts along the ground. Um, but at night, when the sun goes down, AM radio stations are allowed, or they actually um, do what's called a, a, a sky wave propagation. And um, it's not possible when the sun is up, but when the sun is down, the AM signal is actually traveling along the Earth's ionosphere and is able to thus cover a much greater area. And as a result of uh, that happening, most AM radio stations have to lower their power at night in order to protect the ones that have uh, the higher class of license. Um, in the case of 710, that's WOR in New York. And uh, so you'll start to hear them coming in on top of us in the evening hours, and then we shut off, Then you'll hear them loud and clear throughout most of the night. Some nights you'll hear a combination of the Spanish station in Miami with um, WOR in New York, and then the next morning we'll come back on. I haven't tried that, but I'll have to go back and look at it. Again, uh, I'm just looking at time. We're not quite at the end of it. I do have so many more questions for you, but I've got a couple of them uh, that I want to try to uh, work in. Um, tell us about some of the community involvement that Surge Radio has been in uh, since you've been here. Well, um, there hasn't been a whole lot yet, but there's... Uh, more that's uh, going to be coming. There's a Duplin Roads event coming up in Wallace next Saturday that we're uh, we're sponsoring, and uh, I'm actually really excited because uh, I get to fire a cannon. <laughs> oh, cool! <laughs> are you going to do a remote um, a, a broadcast, or are you just going to be present? Um, I think uh, we're just going to be present. We're not really going to broadcast from there. Um, I haven't really uh, hammered out all the details with uh, Lou Powell yet. I think that's her name. That's correct. She's yeah. the uh, chamber uh, director. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, we might, uh, I don't know if we're going to set up a booth or anything like that there, but it, it's it's a possibility, I think. And uh, there's also the upcoming uh, Strawberry Festival that we're looking into, uh, into uh, sponsoring as well. Yeah, and, and, you know, one of the things that you'll see us, uh, one of the things that we've mentioned on this show is the new biz, um, the Duplin County Small Business Challenge that uh, we're in the formation of. We're going to have booths. We're going to be part of many of the festivals throughout the county uh, promoting that. And, um, you know, one of the things that I think, um, you know, we I look forward to is working with you, not just here with this show, but in a lot of the community involvement. 
Well, folks, uh, as Click and Clock used to say, you've wasted another good hour talking, uh, listening to Ken and I talk. Um, Ken, I want to thank you so much for being, being willing, willing to, to be uh, our guest and look forward to talking with you more. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right. All right, folks, uh, this is it for today. We'll be back next Saturday from 9 to 10, uh, where we'll have Jimmy Tate talking about uh, James Front Community College. Um, Y'all have a great weekend.